I am just switching over to our next guest, which will be Lee Camp of Redactors Tonight. So one moment while I do that. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Lee Camp. It's great to have you on again. I know that you participated in the uh, previous vigil as well. Uh, one moment. You are now unmuted. Hey, thanks for having Hi. me. Hi. You're very, very welcome. Um, I wanted. I know that uh, you obviously participated in the last vigil, the Reconnect yeah. Julian vigil, and unfortunately, it's been you know going into the third month since that time. Julian Assange is still. Um, disconnected from the outside world. What are your thoughts on on what we've seen, um, the developments since uh, our last vigil? Yeah, I mean, it seems like it just keeps getting worse. Uh, they're they're clearly just trying to um, sideline and crush him at every at every step, and 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 keep him disconnected from the world because uh, the the level of influence I think they've decided that he's able to have even. Uh, simply being on the internet from the Ecuadorian embassy is too much for them. And uh, obviously the leadership in Ecuador is now, now seems to increasingly be turning their back on him. Um, and, uh, you know, as you and uh, Susie have documented, it's impacting his health and uh, it's really is uh, a, a terrible situation. And, and something I, I kind of wanted to stress is that it, it could be, it, it, Julian could be any of us if we had enough power. Uh, he, he was so successful and WikiLeaks was so successful at revealing the truth that that's why he finds himself in this situation. And uh, it really could be any of us. So anybody out there who is even a, you know, low level uh, independent journalist or citizen journalist, or uh, even just, you know, you, you, consider yourself someone that uh, focuses a lot on trying to sp spread the truth to people. If any of us were to get to that level, uh, I think we would be equally crushed and maligned and have the equal amounts of propaganda thrown against us. And uh, I, I think that's an important point because it's not like it's something specific about Julian uh, that is that is why he faces the situation. Instead, it's the specifics of what he was able to accomplish in terms of uh, getting truth out to the actual people and not just the ruling elite. That's absolutely an incredible point and really extremely true. I mean, we see so much effort in the media to make this about Julian Assange's personality and not about the work that he does. That's an amazing point. Yeah, uh, absolutely. They, they, and you, you actually can see that same strategy used against Snowden or Chelsea Manning. It's, it's let's make it about their personality or something in their past, because if they make it about the the reality of the truth that's come forward, or that that argument is not one they want to have. Exactly, and that's a, we also see that in the um, portrayal in the media narrative of the issue with the embassy itself being about. Uh, you know, skipping bail. And that is so clearly not the real issue at hand, you know, so we see that all over it, every aspect of this story. It, it, it reminds me of now that the now that the charges have all been dropped, except for skipping bail, it reminds me of when when people uh, are arrested by police, protesters are arrested by police, and one of the things they charge them with is resisting arrest, and then the other stuff is dropped, and then they just have a resisting arrest. And it's like, well, why, were, why was I being arrested? Oh, well, that doesn't matter. You were resisting arrest. It's like, yeah. you can't just charge yeah. someone for resisting a non-existent arrest. Absolutely. Yeah. And obviously there were never any charges filed against Julian, which is so incredible. What is so incredible about this situation too, is the, the definite like false portrayal that there is some sort of charge against him that is public. And there isn't, there may be a secret, there is very likely a secret uh, indictment against him from the U S but obviously the press wants to ignore that. Um, it's just an incredible amount of smearing and deflection. Yeah, and a, and, and a lot of people don't, They, uh, I think your average uh, person that may be even somewhat in tune of the, with the news that's going on doesn't realize that all the charges have been dropped. And uh, even more don't realize that uh, Sweden, I can't remember if they came forward and said it or leaked emails showed it or whatever, but that they were, they wanted to drop the charges four years ago and were pressured by the British to continue this charade for another four years.
Absolutely. That was revealed by Stephanie Amoritzi and her amazing uh, results of her FOIA showed that. I mean, the Swedish authorities did drop their investigation in 2017, finally. But as you say, that was years after they wanted to, according to the documents that uh, Stephanie published. But incredible. Right. So uh, what do you, why do you um, amongst, I mean, we've had a number of journalists on this vigil, but I feel like there, there should be so many more journalists speaking up in the way that our panelists have. What makes you unique? What makes uh, the journalists that we've had, why is it only you all that see it this way and are willing to openly speak about it and stick your neck out for Julian Assange and WikiLeaks? Why aren't more journalists doing the same thing? God, I don't. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think uh, 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 the the structural integrity of certain backbones is not of the highest order. I think. <laughs> um, it, it, I think there there because there has been such a high level of of propaganda and maligning of Julian Assange that they're afraid that they're they'll be taint, tainted even even if they agree with everything they agree with WikiLeaks and all of that. Uh, everything that's come, been brought forward, uh, I think they're afraid they're somehow tainted by association of just putting their neck out there and saying they support uh, Julian Assange or, or, or don't think that he should be imprisoned at all. And, you know, that is a sad statement in and of itself of journalism um, in America and globally, uh, that there are so few journalists that are that are willing to take that step, even of the ones that are not that are that are not part of the mainstream corporate structure. Uh, I mean, I think it's easy to say why you aren't seeing a lot of like CNN journalists on the on this panel tonight. Yeah, no, um, that that's uh, pretty much a given. But <laughs> that, that's a given. But yeah, the question is why why aren't uh, there there more independent journalists and and things like that? And 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 why why are you talking to a comedian right now? Uh, I I agree, um, and it it is a, it is a sad statement of of people are putting uh, I think careerism uh, ahead of what they should stand for, um, and they every journalist out there should realize that th that this if you aren't going to stand up for this, you really aren't standing up for journalism at all. Uh, you even if you don't. Even if you, you know, were to disagree with uh, certain things or certain things Julian Assange has tweeted or whatever, it, you should still stand up for journalists to not be imprisoned with no charges. Uh, Absolutely. It, it's, it's amazing that, that they can't uh, make that connection and realize that this is one step in many towards uh, fascism and sidelining of, of truth and knowledge and journalism. And so yeah, I, I absolutely agree. There should be, you, you, you should have so many journalists calling in that you can't deal with them all. Yeah, that, that would be in a, in a world that had any moral uh, sanity left whatsoever. But it really seems to speak to the uh, the death of journalism as as having any integrity at all be when you have um, organizations like WikiLeaks and, as you said, comedians having to step up and actually take the role of journalism and actually taking that weight on where it maybe wasn't necessary before. It wasn't so clear that it was necessary, although comedians have always had really sharp insight, obviously, on politics and on the political sphere, but. Yeah, yeah, people often ask me or, uh, you know, wonder why it is that, com that uh, comedians, and, and I guess there's specifically a, a few, uh, my show and Jimmy Doors and, and a couple others, are the ones talking about a lot of these issues, such as election fraud, such as so much that has come forward through WikiLeaks. Um, and, I, I don't know exactly, except to say that many of us as comedians are used to speaking our mind and not really being uh, instructed on how to move forward in a career track, uh, whereas many journalists have have grown forward and have gone their years, their, you know, sometimes decades of their life have been how do I get forward in this in this career in this business in this uh, specific uh, uh, you know job at a specific corporate entity, and very few of them break free of that, uh, and and so their their kind of education has been how to fit in to some degree in this corporate mindset, and uh, I you know that might be some of it. There are very few that have done for, like what uh, you know Chris Hedges did and. 
stood up against the Iraq war, was then forced out at the New York Times and said, you know what, I don't care. I'm going to keep going down the path that I know is right. Uh, and so and maybe it has to do with the fact that that comedians don't we very rarely have like a, a set career path. It's all very much like I'm going to go out there and speak my mind. And, you know, most comedians are just doing it for laughs. Obviously, they're, they're not worried that much about politics or that much about the news of the day. Um, but it's possible that we haven't had the indoctrination that is kind of required uh, of many or almost all journalists, I guess. Absolutely. No, I think it's it's really an insight to really think about it in that way, um, as if the structure of journalists and journalistic organizations, outlets, the legacy press media, uh, that that structure is actually strangling the ability for genuine uh, journalists with integrity to rise up and have a voice, whereas the, maybe the lack of structure within uh, the comedic scene allows that type of uh, free flow of information more. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That, could, that could be part of it. I'm going to um, check chat really fast to see if we have any questions for you. Uh, chat, please. We love it when you collaborate with us in asking our panelists questions. So if you have them, leave them in chat. We will be collecting them on our Etherpad and asking questions of our guests. And so I wanted to ask you as well, Lee, uh, what, you th what you think will be the outcome on the independent media sphere if, as Assange, if Assange has continued to be, uh, to be silenced in the way that he is right now? Um, will that have a chilling effect? on the independent media and its publications of, of really hard hitting news that is not covered by corporate press. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think that if we allow Julian Assange, Assange's imprisonment, which, you know, it basically is right now, but it could get even worse, obviously, if he were extradited to the US or, or what have you. Uh, I, I think it, it very much would have a chilling effect. And I think other journalists should be thinking about that. Um, as I said before, this this is something that we should all be standing up for because it, it, it's any one of us that that puts out uh, knowledge or information that is harmful to the uh, corporate states, the ruling elite. Um, it really could be now, now. Most of us don't have access to the the level of information that Julian was able to create. Uh, that that flow that he, that river he was able to open with WikiLeaks. Um, so in that way, we're not as threatening and that's why we're not all locked up the way he is, but it just goes to show that th th this does chill out, uh, um, active journalism and pushing against those barriers that the, the corporate state has carefully set up. And I, I think your last guest, uh, said it very well that this has beautifully shown how in line the, media, even some of the, the media that was considered to be a little more legit, like The Guardian, uh, how in line when push comes to shove they are with the, the ruling elite and the corporate state. Um, they, at the end of the day, they're going to protect their own. They're going to protect their, their, their funders and their, their sponsors that are, uh, you know, weapons contractors and and Wall Street and and the the government that they now own, so it, it really did display that you could put forward very important truths, truths that uh, are are gut wrenching in what they mean for our society, and every journalist should be covering them and talking about them and talking about the surveillance state in which we live or the the the, the you know collateral uh, murder videos and things like that. And instead they pivoted and decided it was time to attack the messenger and dumb down, try and get the, the populace back, back into the box of before they had this knowledge. Um, and, you know, to, to some degree, I guess they've, they've succeeded, but in a lot of ways they haven't. And, and I, I hope that it's kind of too late in that sense that the, the information has been released and, you can't really get us back to how dumb we were before or uninformed we were before. You know, I think it's really uh, an important, crucial point to reemphasize that, as you said, anybody, anyone who does the work that Julian Assange has done would have been smeared in some way. There would have been some attempt to just create an ad hominem attack in order to deflect from the work that they've done. I think that's something that we haven't discussed yet on this stream that is 
really crucial to uh, our audience's understanding of why, instead of challenging any of the work that WikiLeaks and Julian Assange has done, we just see them attacking his personality. Um, so do you have any comment on the role that uh, WikiLeaks, how, how WikiLeaks has impacted your journalism? I know we talked about this a little bit in the previous vigil, but I'd like to, uh, for our guests who didn't participate in that, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the way that if WikiLeaks had not published the information that it has, your uh, journalism uh, would have been affected. Well, in terms of a direct sense, I definitely, you know, use WikiLeaks files or quote from them regularly. Uh, I maybe should be a little ashamed to admit that I haven't finished it, but I'm actually still making my way through the WikiLeaks files. Uh, Fantastic. Book. Uh, but, you know, that, that book alone, I think, is one of the best uh, analyses of the, the economic and militaristic empire uh, that uh, America has created and, 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 and lays it out in a way that I don't think many people have laid it out, really the, the full breadth of why uh, America chooses to uh, invade or economically infiltrate or whatever it is, uh, various countries and why other ones they don't. And it really is laid out better than I've ever seen it. Um, but so there's a kind of direct way in that I'm, I'm quoting from, from various uh, uh, files or, or things like that and, and cables. And, but to me, the more influential way it's impacted me and impacted uh, millions around the world is the ripples of the events that, that WikiLeaks helped create. I spoke about this on the last vigil. And, and part of the reason that I, I find it so interesting is because it, it, I feel like it occurred to me late. Like, I don't feel like I really put it, added it all up until, um, you know, a year ago or something, uh, long after most of these events had already transpired. But if you go down the list of the biggest events in the past, you know, 10 years that uh, threatened at all this kind of infinite war empire, this, this economic destruction, this unfettered uh, capitalist environmental destruction. It, the, if you if you look at the biggest events that that did not fit into that line of tr tr the the standard trajectory that the the power elite want it to go, and actually pushed back against it in a large way, almost all of them are connect. Maybe all of them are connected to WikiLeaks or were a ripple on a ripple of something WikiLeaks did. You know, so the, the Arab Spring, uh, which helped spawn Occupy, which uh, ha the Bernie Sanders movement would not have existed without the Occupy sentiment and the ideas that had already been put forward into the, the, uh, the zeitgeist, the, you know, the, the idea of the 99 percent, the idea of this economy should work for all of us instead of just a, a rich few. Um, so much of that goes back to Occupy and so much of that goes back to the Arab Spring and and a lot of the Arab Spring would not have happened with that would not have sparked off without the information coming out of WikiLeaks. Um, and then you, and then, like I uh, like I said, I think a lot of the Bernie Sanders movement, the understanding of election fraud, which I covered a lot on Redacted tonight in 2016, uh, the, the election fraud in the primary, the laughable. Uh, voting system we have here in the United States, uh, a large Harvard study called it the worst in the Western world. And I felt like the, the information and corruption coming out from uh, WikiLeaks on that front showed the, the collusion between the media and the DNC and, and it got a lot of people to ask a lot of very important questions um, on, uh, on that topic. Uh, and then uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the, the information that came out about that, and ultimately Donald Trump pulled out of it, you know, as he is a, a, a moron, in my opinion, he pulled out for all the wrong reasons and may very well rejoin it. But the fact that that ever happened, and at least right now, uh, the TPP is not of completion, uh, has to do with the information that, that came out through WikiLeaks. And and. You know, you, you, you put all these together and it really is the largest dissent and protest movements in this world uh, that have taken place over the past 10 years. And they all seem to have 
uh, been to, to either a small degree or often a very large degree sparked by the information coming out from WikiLeaks. And, and personally, that was obviously influ influential in my own activism. Um, I was at, you know, I was at the first night of Occupy and, and I was at uh, a lot of a lot of Occupy encampments around uh, America and Canada. And and it it, it helped uh, grow me as a as both a comedic journalist, if that's a thing, and as an activist. And, um, and and so I think it, it was pivotal for me. But uh, I think more than that, it's been pivotal for our society as a whole. And all of these things I just listed is why WikiLeaks and Julian Assange are so dangerous to a system that is a, a, a profit over all else, a war for wealth over the welfare of people system that is completely unsustainable. It kills so many people around the world every day. And, and most of the pushback that that system has gotten in a large sense has it has come uh, has at least been slightly sparked by WikiLeaks. I completely agree, and I, I appreciate you uh, walking us through those different social movements. Uh, that's we've actually had another guest who uh, brought up some of those movements as well, and I think it's really fantastic that that we're discussing those impacts that WikiLeaks has had. And I also want to say thank you for holding up the WikiLeaks files because as Julian Assange is silenced right now, it is so it is even more imperative that people look at the text that he's authored and actually read his words because obviously he can't speak to us right now. So thank you. You for that yeah um, people people should read and reread that book because uh it, 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 even if you've already read it there you, there's no way you uh aren't going to find more you missed the first time around and it is such an impressive and cogent analysis of what's going on in our world and the 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 way the hegemony actually works and kind of what it wants <laughs> and how it's getting it uh so yeah i i think people should get that book or reread it. Yeah, uh, uh, Julian Assange has written a number of books and I'll try to get links to those in the chat for you all to look up and to read and to find yourselves. Uh, do you have any um, sentiments that you want to share about um, about how you feel the audience can help WikiLeaks directly? I know you've, you've already spoken about uh, the need for independent journalists to come out and support Julian Assange, but what can somebody do at home who is not a journalist and is not a comedian, but who wants to participate but feels uh, powerless and unempowered to uh, actually make a difference? Well, I know your last guest, guest talked about civil disobedience, and I think that is very important. Uh, these are crucial times, and that is definitely uh, a significant step um, for the so many people watching out there that maybe aren't, uh, you know, either willing or able to uh, put their bodies on the line. Um, I think that a lot of it just has to do with having the conversations and talking to people about about what Julian Assange created, about what WikiLeaks is and not allowing that discussion to get sidelined in, in the mud, which is what uh, you know, our propaganda outlets want us to do. They want us to fight about and, and bicker about something that, that Julian tweeted that you might not agree with. Um, they, they really want that to be the discussion. So I think when people are talking to others, friends and family members and stuff and posting on social media about this stuff, they, 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 you need to have the, the actual legitimate debate, which is whether a journalist and people can keep in mind that nothing WikiLeaks has ever put out has been proven false. So this is a journalistic outlet with one of the best track records or the best track record that anyone has ever seen. And whether journalists like that should be imprisoned um, for years on end without contact to the outside world for their work. And I think that has to be the debate. Shift the debate. Don't let them pull you into what the, the, the debate they want you to have, because no matter where you come out on it, you, you've already been sidetracked. You've already been removed from the important discussion that needs to be had and, and, you know, and get angry. And, and part of getting angry, I think, for a lot of people is to realize how this isn't about one uh, man. This is about 
uh, an idea and uh, our freedom of press and our freedom of information. Um, that's what this fight is is about. And people need to realize that, you know, because I, I think it's it's too easy to be like, oh, well, it's just one person. So I'm not really going to, you know, get all up in arms over one, you know, another another victim of this. But it, it, it is it is the ideas. And and I think that's why people need to be totally furious about this. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important distinction. I know um, some of the the pushback that um, that Caitlin Johnstone and, and myself and others have gotten when we uh, report on Julian Assange being um, mistreated in the way that he is and per, uh, persecuted uh, by this unelected power structure. Uh, people say, "Well, there are th- you know hundreds and hundreds of people dying every day for, from various aspects of this," which is true and absolutely valid. But as you are saying, that the the, the importance of what is happening to Julian Assange is that it harms all of us. It harms the the um, ability for, for press to be free. It harms the information that journalists have access to as independent journalists. And it harms, uh, you know, the taxpayers even who in the UK who are paying for the for the policing of the embassy. So there are all of these ways that the WikiLeaks and what Julian Assange does is is uh, empowering us and is in our benefit. So therefore, it is a massive loss for us. It harms us to have him continue to be uh, silenced. So yeah, and it's and it's like uh, you know when when. Chris Hedges and some others um, took Obama to court over the NDAA because it basically allowed for the imprisonment of journalists without a trial or charges. Uh, it, it, this is the same idea. This is they they were taking trying to take Obama to court based on that idea that that is something that should not be legal in our country, um, and I believe anywhere in the world. Uh, and this should be th- this fight is the exact same exact same idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have um, any, can you explain to the audience how you evolved from, like, cause you mentioned before that comedians often, you know, are not, are not particularly politically minded. So what kind of created for you personally, your unique brand of activism as journalism? I, I mean, I know it was the Occupy movement, but what really changed your mind about viewing comedy as a, as a vehicle of activism, as opposed to just for laughs? Well, yeah, I was an activist before Occupy. Uh, I think Occupy just lit more of a fire under it, maybe. But um, yeah, I just want to, you know, I grew up just wanting to be a comedian and it wasn't about politics. Um, But then as I began to learn more uh, about what's going on in our world and uh, I I was going to say earlier that the only other book I can think of that really lays out the uh, American hegemony as well as the, the WikiLeaks files is uh, John Perkins' Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And that book was uh, pivotal in my understanding of things and how we use economics to crush so many countries or to at least keep them under our, uh, under our uh, guidance, doing what we want, treating their people the way that is beneficial to our profit at the end of the day. Um, so as I became more informed on this stuff and the Iraq war was was popping off in 2003 and, uh, you know, I, I think most for most young Americans, that was a time of like, wait, we we really just go to war for no reason. I mean, e- even when they were even when before we knew there were no weapons of mass destruction, it was still like, wait, why are we just totally destroying this country? Uh, and so I think that that. Uh, woke a lot of people up as to like the, the fact that our wars are not at all what we're told they are or for the reasons um, and the number of people dying in them is is horrific uh, to say the least so as a you know so I started being more of an activist off stage, but then I kind of felt like well I, I'm given this platform in that my career is as a comedian and I want to use that platform there aren't many there aren't many performance uh, or art forms out there left where you speak your mind, you don't speak a script. And uh, I kind of felt like if I'm going to be on stage every night of the week, I want to talk about important shit. And so I, I started talking more, I started putting more and more uh, politics or, or activism, cultural commentary into my, into my act. And it, it grew from there. Um, and I do think that, that comedy and 
maybe uh, art in general are uniquely positioned to get people to listen to ideas that they might turn off from too quickly to really think about them or analyze them or give them a chance. Uh, it, you know, people might listen to something that's funny a little longer than if it were boring and they're just like, oh, that's, that's not the immediate uh, viewpoint that I have that doesn't immediately ping the little dopamine response that says, I agree. So therefore I'm going to shut it off. Well, luckily comedy has this thing where it excites people who, even when they don't agree with it, they're willing to listen a little longer. And so I think it's important. It's important in that respect. Um, another thing that, that I feel like was pivotal for me and hopefully the, the viewers can find kind of useful in, in its meeting is not actually, con well, I, it's a little bit funny. So maybe it is, maybe it's got some comedic relationship, but, uh, there was a death row prisoner in Texas named Kenneth Foster, who was going to be executed. This is probably 2004 or five or something. Uh, maybe, yeah, some, somewhere in there. Anyway, he was going to be executed, but unlike most executions in the U.S. that anyone's ever heard of, the prosecution said that he was not, he had not killed anyone. He was driving a car. His friend got out, got in a fight, killed someone. They were going to put the driver to death under what they call the law of parties, which if you're even near someone who kills someone, we can execute you. So it was about four days before the execution. He'd exhausted all the appeals and everything. and. Um, and I was just a you know small time comedian. I I didn't have a platform. I didn't even have a YouTube show back then. I don't I don't know if YouTube existed yet really. Uh, and so I was like, how can I have some kind of input impact? The only way this guy's life is going to be saved is if you know Governor Rick Perry commutes the sentence. And Rick Perry loved uh, executing people, so it seemed very unlikely. And so I called the governor's office and I I said I was uh, making a film about the death of Kenneth Foster. And uh, she put me through to the press secretary and I said, I want to interview the governor. And, uh, you know, and uh, she was like, well, I could ask the governor about a possible interview. And uh, I said, great, you could just email me back on the movie's website. It's info at blood on Texas, And uh, that was a long, awkward pause. And uh, but I and, and so she said, OK, well, I'll get back to you. And I do feel that she probably brought that to Rick Perry to let him know this movie was being made now. I don't want to overstate my impact. There were plenty of activists in Texas that were sitting in his driveway and things like that. But I think that, uh, and he, and he ultimately commuted Kenneth Foster's, uh, uh, or not commuted. Uh, yeah, commuted. So he, so he didn't get the death penalty, but he's still, he's still in jail, unfortunately, but he's still alive. And it showed whatever small impact, you know, my little pressure or moment of anxiety, it might've given Rick Perry, uh, it made me feel that a very small number of people working to save someone or help someone can have an impact. It's not all hopeless, even when it's those last four days before a very murderous governor is getting ready to execute someone. Uh, and, and for me, and I, and I find this with a lot of activists, that you, you find out they had a moment where they had an impact or they saw that uh, sometimes they were just part of a, a lot of people and they saw that that could have an impact or change something. And once you see that it's, it's addictive in a good way that you realize a small number of people can have a, a massive impact uh, despite all of the losses and all of the, uh, you know, million times before that, that it wasn't able to change the path of things. Sometimes a, a very tiny number of people can, can change things. And I think, uh, Julian Assange and a small group of people that that were the original uh, people at, at WikiLeaks have proven that a small number of people can have a massive impact. And uh, I just think people need to keep that in in their in their mind as as things seem so hopeless. Absolutely. I think it's really um, fascinating, the creativity of that, of, of making, uh, talking about making a documentary about the issue. That's the type of creativity that I think viewers and supporters of WikiLeaks and Julie need to employ to make this message heard. And, mm -hmm. and it's really, I, I feel that people um, discount their own agency in this and in, and in making a difference. So you, uh, it's definitely impossible to overstate 
the importance of that type of action. Definitely. Yeah. And if you, if you have any, uh, I, if you have any creative ideas about how people can help in, in any sort of uh, ways that are out of the legitimately out of the box, please, uh, you know, extrapolate it on them. Cause I know that a lot of people have like, um, being in a moderating position, I see so many people asking over and over again, no matter what we say on the vigil and no matter what we uh, report on uh, through our own media platforms, the constant question is, how can I help? I want to help. I support WikiLeaks and Julian, but I feel powerless. What do I do? And so if you have any creative ideas on that, I'd, li I'd really like to hear them for our, for our viewers. Well, I, I, I would say that, you know, calling these lawmakers... Uh, and maybe finding creative ways to uh, approach them. And I mean, probably over, you know, phone or email um, or Twitter, uh, creative ways to, to approach them that, that maybe they fear for their position, that maybe they fear that a lot of their voters are now caring about this issue. Um, you know, you got to think about what, what do these position, these people in positions of power that actually have the ability to, uh, significantly uh, change Julian's plight. Uh, what is it they fear for? Well, they fear for whether they're going to be reelected. They they uh, fear for whether their their brand name is going to be tarnished in the in the media or on Twitter. Um, so I, I think that is is maybe one way to try and think a little more creatively um, how to influence them. But you know, uh, like. Uh, the, the 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 small number of people that may at times go outside uh, the window at the Ecuadorian embassy and you know stand there with candles or or whatever else they're doing, it, I'm sure it feels uh, at times somewhat hopeless. You see, you know, if you're three people standing there outside the embassy, but I think a lot of this stuff feels hopeless until it's not. I think that you know the first uh, the the first uh, civil rights activist sitting at the lunch counters when. It's only five of them and they're getting spit on and beat up and called horrible names. Um, I don't think they thought they were going to achieve civil rights the following day. And it took 10 years. Um, and, and so I just I think you can't you can't underestimate the, the, the ripples that uh, small acts can have if you just keep at them. Um, I don't want to I don't want to overstate things and say, yeah, you, you show up there with that candle and we will win. Um, but. I think that people are too quick uh, to just say, ah, that's never going to do anything. It, it seems like there's a bit of, it's a bit of a self-protection thing to say, oh, we can't, we can't do it. It's not going to work. That would never work. They're too powerful. Um, it's a bit of a self-protection thing. It's also kind of cooler in our society to be like, eh, 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 it's not happening. We're not going to do it. We can't do it. Uh, it's cooler to do that than to be the person that's like, come on, guys, we can do this. But uh, I think that, you know, maybe put your put your cynicism aside for a minute and realize that everything that's ever changed in this world started with a small number of people. Yeah, I think that there's like two prongs to that sentiment. There's the side that says, oh, this is so insurmountable, that we'll never be able to make a difference. And then there's also the side that says, oh, it's already being taken care of. It's almost like too much hope, like like yeah. too much uh, like this false idea that things will just sort themselves out without your interference. So definitely there are, are multiple uh, facets of that apathy that, yeah, it, it's really sad. It's a sad statement on our culture that that is cool to be apathetic. Right. right. I think, and not just with the, you know, this scenario, Julian Assange, but with our society as a whole or what's going wrong or our government or, uh, you know, the government of whichever country you're in right now watching this, uh, a lot of people think like, oh, I'm sure someone's handling that. No, no one's handling it. No one is in charge of making sure that that changes or that we fix things. Anytime you think like, ah, oh, they've, they've got it. What can I do? They've got, no one's got it. No one's got it. Get in there. You, you be the one that's got it. You know? Exactly. No, I think, uh, I think if any, it, that's one of the major things WikiLeaks is absolutely exposed. I mean, the things that, that happen and the way that the, um, you know, the, the, the reality behind the scenes is so much not what we are what we are told and what we expect sort of growing up in the society that we're in. So I think that's a definitely important point to to um, to prevent that sort of false uh, sense of security in the way that the system operates. Yeah, and actually a lot of the you know whistleblowers we know or people that have stood up, you hear stories from them that they kept thinking someone else was going to do it. Uh, I think maybe uh, 
Edward Snowden has said that at some point that he kind of figured someone was going to reveal it and, and no one did. And I think he said then Obama got into power and he thought Obama would do something about it and he never did. And a lot of these people thought someone else was going to handle it and then realized, oh, my God, it's on me. Um, I think John Kariaku has said the same, that he kept thinking someone else was going to uh, blow the whistle on the on the torture. And it just no one was revealing it. No one was stopping it. And ultimately, a lot of whistleblowers suddenly realize, oh, shit, it's me. I'm the one. Absolutely incredible point. And very true. That is absolutely what uh, John has told us. Uh, multiple whistleblowers. I believe you're right about the quote from Snowden. That's exactly um, his sentiment. And, and I think that that um, it speaks to the way in which our audience should understand that the, the people that act in this way are not some sort of idol. They're, they're, as Susie has said, they're very much normal human beings who simply have made the right choice against really in, insane odds. So it's important not to underestimate the fact that we are all um, equally able to act uh, in ways that truly do make a difference. And so I just wanted to repeat that, but I'm gonna also just look through chat. I'm sure that we have a lot of comments and questions for you from them. Come um, on, chatters. Come on, chat guys, collaborate with us, come on. I want questions from you. But I, I also want your thoughts, Lee, as I look as I look through what chat has to offer us. Um, I wanna know your question, your thoughts um, just on, on Julian Assange as a, as a human being and the human rights that are being so, uh, hypocritically violated by the West, who then uses human rights as a as a battle cry against other nations. Can you talk about that hypocrisy uh, with us when it when it comes to Julian Assange? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. If there's one thing, you know, uh, America's number one export is hypocrisy. So we're uh, it's great for our GDP. Um, Very good point. Yeah. <laughs> No, the, every time, every, <laughs> I, I think I said on Redacted Tonight once that every time you hear an American official say, oh, there's, there's, we got to go in because there's human rights abuses over there or we're, we're, we're going to, you know, we, we're going to put economic sanctions on this country because of the human rights abuses. It, it's like we are the number one perpetrator of human rights abuses. Uh, and whenever we're saying that, I kind of view it as like a, a hot dog salesman is upset that another hot dog salesman's on his corner. It's basically like the American officials are like, you can't do human rights abuses. That's our thing. We have cornered the market on that. I mean, the number of people dying, the David DeGraw's piece recently said, I think that a uh, hundred under the Trump administration, 140 bombs a day roughly are being dropped, uh, killing, you know, uh, God knows how many innocent civilians. And that number was, you know, like 100 under Obama. So it's not it's not like it wasn't uh, horrific under Obama as well. Um, and so, yeah, these these to, to act like for, for America to act like we, you know, stand up for journalists and stand up for freedom of press and, and things like that. Meanwhile, our officials are pushing the, the the containment of Julian Assange. Many of them have pushed the assassination of Julian Assange. Some have talked about dropping a, a drone bomb on the Ecuadorian embassy. I mean, this is those statements should be horrific to any journalist out there um, or anyone who respects uh, the 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 job, the duty of re relaying truth to the public. Um, and, and these, these people are, the, the amazing thing is these officials that say these things, they, they aren't drummed out. They are propped up. They, they are, you know, continue to recycle and come forward no matter the level of uh, war crimes they've been involved in, in the past. Uh, you know, the same people that, that helped push the invasion of Iraq with the WMD lie are now front and center again, largely pushing Russiagate. Um, you know, Mueller, Mueller was uh, the head of the FBI when we invaded uh, Iraq. And you can watch his Senate testimony saying there's WMD and we have to invade Iraq. And now a million people are dead for these lies. And obviously these people should be in jail for war crimes, but if they're not gonna be in jail, how about they're just not allowed to ever have a job in government again or they're never allowed on our media, our corporate media again. But instead, it's quite the opposite. They're they're put forward as if they have some sort of expertise, and their expertise 
seems to be war crimes. So yeah, there's there's plenty of uh, hypocrisy to go around. Absolutely, and, and in the se- and the the inverse of that is we have the same. Um, actual patriots and heroes um, like the members of the Veteran Intelligence Professionals of Sanity, VIPs. I know you've spoken to Ray McGovern and they they spoke out against the Iraq war before it happened, but they didn't have the, the reach that they now have through the internet and through social media. And I know that they have, you know, continued to speak out against false narratives uh, in the last few years. So if you have any thoughts on that, I'd really like to hear them because I know that you've been uh, a big fan of Ray McGovern's and VIPs for yeah. a while. Yeah, everybody should look up uh, v- VIPS or Ray McGovern. Um, Ray McGovern has a website you can find pretty easily. And yeah, he was a, he, you know, for, for those who don't know, 27 year uh, CIA veteran. Uh, he was, he would brief uh, the first President Bush and, and then retired in 1990. And actually, this is another example of someone who thought that they could be retired. And then he realized um, that no one else was from the from the CIA or from, you know, with his level of experience was standing up and saying that this was wrong, calling out the the crimes that were going on under our government. And and so he uh, helped found uh, VIPS. And their first thing they ever did was put out a statement to George uh, Bush saying that um, the the information, the intel he was getting on on weapons of mass destruction was incorrect. And he was going to invade a country for false uh, under false pretenses. Now, I I think that I I don't know Bush himself, but the military industrial complex and and those telling him what to do or whatever, um, they didn't care whether there were WMD there or not. They probably knew there weren't, uh, and they just wanted they they needed to invade Iraq for the geopolitical power a combination of the oil and the central banking and a few other details there. But uh, so, you know, but, but in terms of what Ray's done is, is Ray realized that other people were not going to come forward and, and talk about these things that, that, you know, ex CIA and the, the VIPS continues to put out very important memos. Uh, one of the most recent ones was their evidence that the, the, "Quote unquote hack of the DNC was actually an internal leak, um, and they they put out that statement. Um, and if it is a leak, that that obviously means that it wasn't R- Russia or or any outside hacker. Um, so yeah, those are the, it's very important information, and and it's yet again uh, an example of someone realizing that no one else was going to speak out about this stuff." Um, at least not from his branch of government. And he became an activist. And most recently he was, uh, he was tackled and basically beaten for speaking out at Gina Haspel's confirmation, which I, I talked earlier about how these people that are guilty of war crimes are recycled and put back in new positions. Well, Gina Haspel now that has set ahead of the CIA and she oversaw the torture program in, uh, in certain areas of the world. And, it, you know, the those who were involved in the torture program should have been drummed out, should have been forced out. But instead, you see that those who prove they are willing to partake in these these war crimes or, you know, the, the, the militarism and the, the American empire that is crushing so many lives uh, with our military, those who are willing to be involved in it are rewarded with higher positions. And anyway, during her, for those who didn't see it during her hearing, Ray McGovern stood up and calmly said that, she uh, she was guilty of war crimes and oversaw torture and uh, he was dragged out and tackled and heavily bruised. But I saw him, you know, I saw him two days later and he was of chipper spirits because he was of pure mind as to what he did, why he did it. And to me, that's something very powerful is you've got, uh, you know, someone who was beaten up and and by the way because he's in his 70s his arms were all purple from this bruising because you bruise easily at, in your 70s and and he there was not a, a glint of sadness in his eyes because he was doing what he knew he needed to do and I think when you have uh, a purity of purpose and mind like that it is very powerful and uh, can can really uh, keep keep the passion alive in in what you do and and gives 
and gives life meaning as well. So um, I think that people should remember that, you know, if you want to look at the selfish side of things, which I always like to look at the selfish side of things, uh, it's, it's very energizing and worthwhile to uh, stand up for what's right in this world. Absolutely. I think that Ray McGovern and the other members of VIPS have been such an example to us as as far as what actual patriotism looks like, because not only, not only uh, in their stance against war, but also in the way that they have, um, as in the same way that we are trying to be as um, bipartisan in our support for Assange as possible. You know, VIPS has called out, uh, you know, presidents and secretaries of state from uh, both uh, political parties over time. So it's such a, I think it's an inspiration to see that they are, they always seem to put truth above ideology. And I, I think that that is a huge example to all of us. And to go back earlier to what you were saying about the revolving door, that is something we've mentioned a number of times during this vigil. And it's such a crucial point because it's something that WikiLeaks has had a unique role in exposing, you know, in practically all of their leaks, whether it's to do with the uh, the interrelationship between the DNC and the press, whether it's, you know, at the State Department and, and the technocracy, you have all of these different levels of, of revolving door. And, and I didn't know if you had any more comments on, on that or, or how maybe uh, WikiLeaks has uniquely sort of revealed that. Well, I, I think that it, it's yet again, it, it, this actually connects back to what I was saying about a, a lot of journalists is I, I think it shows that you're rewarded in these career paths if you prove y you are willing to um, to do what's needed for that, for the you know, in this case, the empire or the American empire or, or whatever your section of it is, your duty is, um, you know, you move up at the NSA if you are w fine with surveilling the entirety of the American public and you uh, don't show any qualms about that. You move up at the State Department if you are fine with the, the economic destruction that we wreak around the wor world, uh, reap around the world, um, you, you know, it, to, to, to show the level of sickness this is, uh, when Tillerson was at, I played this clip once on my show, when, when Tillerson was at the uh, Secretary of State, he, was, he didn't speak uh, publicly that often, but he was doing an uh, onstage thing with Condoleezza Rice, and he pointed to uh, the fact that North Korean fishermen were washing up dead, starved to death on ghost ships uh, because our sanctions had made it so impossible to eat in North Korea that these fishermen were fishing later and later in the season to try and survive and they were dying of starvation on these boats. And Tillerson, you, you would think a normal human being with any ounce of empathy would go, isn't that horrible? But Tillerson was using it as an example of, look at how great our sanctions are. Look at how well they're working. And I, I granted, Tillerson didn't rise up at the State Department. He came from ExxonMobil. But uh, the point is, if you're willing to have those kind of thoughts, if you're willing to be a borderline sociopath, you can rise up at these in these institutions if you never question uh, things such as sanctions that cause people to starve to death. If you are willing to be that that careerist and and have those horse blinders on for the, you know this is what what needs to be done, then you rise up in these in these areas. Now the same goes for the cor corporate world, right? The you, you know we I believe we do live in inverted totalitarianism, which is ruled by the anonymous corporate state. And look at who gets to the boards of corporation. It is those who are who have almost no empathy. It is those who are borderline sociopathic that put profit before all else. If at any point during a 20 or 40 year career, you say, whoa, whoa, hey, everybody, shouldn't we worry about the people that are getting hurt? Not them, you know, in this scenario, like wh what if we what if we uh, call back those tires because people are dying and, it, and it, yeah, it might cost a lot of money, but. What if a couple of people die? If you do that a couple of times, you're not rising up that ladder. You're not going to end up in that boardroom. You're not going to end up at the head of ExxonMobil the way that Tillerson did. And you're not then going to end up as Secretary of State. So it, it really is that it, it's not just a revolving door. It's that those who prove that they are willing to put uh, off and profit above all else, but you know, in some cases, I guess it's the American power above all else, um, if they're willing to do that for decades on end, then they can rise up to the top. As Gina Haspel has, has proven uh, with the CIA, she was willing to 
torture everybody. And some of the things she oversaw was the beating of a pregnant woman that ended up miscarrying. And if you're willing to do that type of thing and don't have qualms with it, then you can rise up to the top of these power structures. Yeah, and that ex I I'm looking at some of the questions we have from chat, and one of the questions is, why aren't politicians who kill millions in jail who has the authority to kill just because you're a president? Uh, and I think that that really addresses the fact, the reason for that, the core reason being that the whole structure is built in a way that supports those types of crimes, as you've just discussed with Tillerson, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it almost seems like that pedigree of sociopathy is what is what helps uh, definitely allow them to move it, uh, from the trusted circles in one aspect of this unelected power structure to the other part of it, et cetera, et cetera, which is just self-perpetuating yeah. and awful. But we have about about 10 minutes left. Uh, what are the sort of like really, um, you know, final thoughts you have for the audience to take in mind as we continue to see Julian Assange silence? Uh, are there any other thoughts that you have to share with us and to um, encourage people to keep fighting for Julian Assange's uh, freedom and his freedom of speech? Well, I would just say it's never too late. Uh, I don't think I think so many of the people that fought tirelessly for Chelsea Manning probably thought it was highly likely she would never get out of prison or at least not for decades and decades. Uh, so I think that's a perfect example of never say never. Um, and the uh, amount of effort it took to keep Chelsea Manning's story at the, in the forefront of the American mind to such a degree that Obama was ultimately willing to uh, let her out. Uh, I think that was really impressive, and and it took a uh, a willingness to fight against all all odds for the I mean for the protesters and for the the people that were really at the helped organize that continuously. And I know that uh, both Assange and WikiLeaks worked hard to uh, help Chelsea Manning. Um, and to me, it's, it's one of the best examples of you, you can think that, that all is lost, that there's really no hope of, of getting someone out of these situations where they are being punished for being a whistleblower or for being a journalist. Um, but it's not, it's, it's really, it's really not hopeless over the long, the long arc of time. Um, I, 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 I hope we have uh, enough time to achieve that end for Julian. And, and you can also look at the way history will view people it changes heavily. Look at Nelson Mandela, who was called a, a terrorist and imprisoned. Uh, and Daniel Ellsberg, when he first revealed the Pentagon, Pentagon Papers, was called a communist and everything else. And now he's, he, he's held up as a, as a shining light of being a whistleblower. And and I, I would like to remind all of the faux liberals out there that hold up Ellsberg as, as a, a true great American that you, are, you, you should feel the same way about Julian Assange and Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning. And the, 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 the fact that you, you know, hold up Ellsberg because it's you know, chic or acceptable in those in those elite liberal circles, but then at the same time say that, you know, Snowden is a traitor and Assange deserves to be drone bombed or whatever uh, is a complete hypocrisy. Absolutely. I think it's really important. It, it's, it's important to, to see the hypocrisy in not only enshrining some and then denigrating others who are doing very similar work, but also the way in which it's as if the establishment itself wants to see the, the dissidents of the past as an example of the, the uh, functioning democracy and functioning system that we have and, and the idea of these Western ideals of freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera. But it, the reality is that at the time those dissidents were active, they were, uh, you know, they were not regarded with any sort of uh, positive feeling from the establishment. They were, yeah. they were very much, um, you know, abused by that same establishment. So I think M Martin Luther King yeah. as well. Exactly. So I think that that remembering that and that that is the reality of the history is important. So yeah, yeah. Thank absolutely. you for bringing and, that up. And it shows the, the the that this idea of the personality attacks, you know, goes back a long ways. So you know, Martin Luther King's personality was attacked endlessly. Um, you know, saying he was a, a communist, a traitor, all of those things. A lot of the same words that are used against Julian Assange or Edward Snowden are the same things that Martin Luther King was being called. And he was, I mean, he was 
quickly abandoned by, you know, any anyone of the right in the country. But even the kind of a lot of the liberal elite uh, abandoned Martin Luther King in his final year or two because of that same type of propaganda. And the same agencies even that are involved in persecuting Julian Assange, because the FBI, unbelievably enough, actually operated in England to persecute Julian Assange. And then you have the same agencies as we know, and I, I am just saying this for the benefit of viewers who don't know, that the FBI actually threatened and uh, and persecuted Martin Luther King very directly and sent all sorts of threats and et cetera, et cetera. So it's really sad to see that parallel continuing through history. Yeah, there's a famous letter that they sent to him trying to get him to take his own life. Absolutely. And so um, I hate to end on a negative note, but I really do appreciate the time, the time that you've spent with us, because I know that you have an extremely busy schedule. Um, do you want to let people know where you'll be in the next few weeks or months where they can find you? Uh, I Obviously, Redacted Tonight, your show is amazing. But are there any other uh, comedy spots that you'd like to let people know that you will be at? Uh, thanks. I just finished a big tour, um, so I don't have that many dates coming up of the for live stand-up comedy, but um, I do tape redacted tonight every week in Washington, D.C. Anyone's welcome to come. Um, I also have a show next week in Asheville, uh, North Carolina. I'll be performing at Vegan Fest. And the last thing that everyone can, uh, can hear more conversations very similar to this, uh, to p political thought. Uh, I do a new podcast called Common Censored. So like common sense, but common censored. And uh, I've started putting that out every week as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I know that we caught you on a very busy uh, schedule of yours. So thank I really do appreciate you for joining us. Thank, and thanks for all your work. I know you're doing many hours and it's 